Well, turn to the person next to you and say, what do you think? <laughs> well, you know, the truth is, is most of us would not want somebody to know what we're thinking, would we? Well, wouldn't it be scary to think about your mind actually being a movie screen? Ooh, that would not be so good. But you know, what we think is extremely important, especially what we think consistently. Now, I'm not saying that every little thought that floats through your mind becomes a reality in your life, but certainly things that we think consistently, the Bible actually says in Proverbs 23, 7, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Or as he thinks in his heart, so does he become. So I like to put it a different way. Where the mind goes, the man follows. We all know that if you think about something long enough, like your favorite dessert, you're probably going to go get it. Even if you have to get in your car and make a trip. It's amazing if we think about something long enough, how it affects all of our emotions and all of our desires and or if you think about what somebody did to you that hurt you for a long period of time, pretty soon you're going to be upset. You're going to feel knots in your stomach. You're going to get tense in your neck. And so our thoughts affect us. I actually could call this Christianity 101 because our thoughts are really the foundation for so many things in our life. And certainly they are the foundation for any kind of victory that we ever hope to have in our life. Now, some of you came here this weekend looking for victory. You came looking for a breakthrough. You came looking to not just hear about the promises of God, but you actually want to walk and live in those promises. And I can tell you that unless our thinking changes, nothing else in our life ever changes. Can anybody say amen to that? Do you agree that we probably have more trouble with our mind than anything else? Okay. But you can learn to do your own thinking. It is a process. It takes determination. It takes study. But we can learn to do our own thinking, and we can actually come to the point where we pretty quickly recognize, with the help of the Holy Spirit, when we have stinking thinking and when we're actually thinking according to the will of God. We will become what we consistently think. Romans 12, 2 is a very wonderful and a foundational scripture in the Word of God. Let's look at it together. Do not be conformed to this world. Don't be like the world. Don't act like the world. Don't think like the world. There's many things that the world does that they think is fine that we cannot and should not do. And I think that also this weekend, we need to make some decisions about where we're going to stand in these days that we live in. Do not be conformed to this world, this age, fashioned after and adapted to its external, superficial, I might as well say meaningless <laughs> customs. But be transformed. Don't be conformed, but be transformed changed by the entire renewal of your mind. So if I want to be changed, if you want to be changed, then my mind has to change before anything else in my life is going to change. And God will help me with that. God will help you with that. He will teach us how to think. And the Holy Spirit is so wonderful that he comes to live inside of us and he will even remind us when we're not thinking right. And then he will even remind us what we should be thinking if we have enough of the word in us to rise up and confront the wrong thing. You know, I spent years judging other people. I can remember one of my favorite things to do was go out to the mall, sit on a bench, and just sit there and judge everybody as they walked by. I mean, I enjoyed it. It was like, well, look at that stupid hairdo. Well, man, how could that girl get a guy like that? And you know, it was just like, 
I didn't know these people and I would just judge them and criticize them. Come on, don't tell me none of you have ever done it. How many of you like to people watch? Eh, thank you. And um, now, honestly, when I have judgmental thoughts, which I do, because the devil offers all of us stinking thinking. All of us. And get this, he always will. This is one area that's never going to just get good. And we're never going to have another temptation or never have to stand against any kind of wrong thoughts. So if you've been a Christian 40 years and you're still having some problems with your mind here and there, or sometimes you find yourself saying, I feel like I'm losing my mind, really, in a way, we are losing our mind when we give the control of it over to the enemy and we don't resist wrong thoughts that are coming against us. And the best way, the very best way to resist wrong thoughts is to open your mouth and speak out loud a portion of scripture that you have learned that you know confronts that wrong thought. And the thought stops immediately because what if you're speaking, that's going through your mind. So the thing that the enemy is trying to put in your mind has to go away. So some days I have to speak the word almost all day long. There are times when we have little attacks. There's times when we have major attacks. I mean, Satan is going to use every opportunity to bombard your mind with every lie and every kind of negative thinking that you've ever heard of in your whole life. Amen? When I was writing the book, The Mind Connection, I was sitting out of town at a place where I do some of my writing, and I was having a physical issue, and it was annoying, and it wasn't going away, and then I got some kind of news from somebody that I didn't particularly care for, and I'm trying to write this book on all this positive thinking, you know, and I'm telling you the truth, for two days, I felt like my mind had been kidnapped. I mean, I actually felt like the enemy just came in and took it, and I couldn't find it, I couldn't get it back no matter what. And I'm gonna teach you tonight what to do during those times. I'm gonna teach you how to fight the devil and win. Actually, I'm gonna teach you how to fight like a Christian. Amen. Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed and changed by the entire renewal of your mind, by its new ideals and its new attitudes, so that you may prove for yourselves what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. Now, I wish that I had the words to tell you and convince you what an amazingly good plan that God has for your life. I mean, the plan that God has for you is so awesome, none of us could believe the great plan that God has for us if he were just to open it up all to us at once. But I think that if you compare all the Christians in the world to the number of people who actually really fulfill their destiny, I think it's probably pitifully few. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't any. There's probably even a lot, but compared to all the believers in the world, all the people who say, I'm a Christian around the world, the people who actually walk in victory, who actually spiritually mature and grow up and become what they're supposed to be in God, do all that God wants them to do and have all that God wants them to have, I think, let's just say at least there's not nearly as many as there should be. How many of you agree with that? There's not nearly as many as there should be. The renewing of our mind according to the word of God is one of the most important things that we need to deal with in our life. Every day, very few days go by that I don't say, God, put a watch over my mouth lest I sin against you with my tongue. And let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. And every day of my life, I confess the word of God out loud. It's part of meditating on the word to remind yourself over and over and over what God's promises are for you. God has a good plan 
for your life. Perhaps you experienced some victory, but then back into bondage. And then a little more victory, and then back into bondage. Or maybe you haven't had very much victory at all in your life. Well, you know, that was certainly the case with me. For eight years, I went to church every single week with Dave and our children, and I was a pitiful mess. And during those eight years, I never one time heard a message about the power of my thoughts or the power of my words. And I wonder how many people go to church week after week after week, year after year after year, and never hear anything about what their own thoughts are doing to them. Many of you, that would be your testimony here tonight. I can't stand here and assume that all of you have heard messages like this over and over, but I, because I know some of you have never heard these kinds of things. And I remember how jaw-dropping it was to me when I began to hear these kinds of things and even began to learn that I actually could do my own thinking, that I didn't have to just sit and meditate on whatever fell in my head. That with the help of the Holy Spirit, I could actually say, no, I'm not going to think that because I know what that's going to produce in my life. And I will think this because this is what God tells me to think. Amen. How many of you have found it's life changing? But even if you know these things, how many of you don't mind hearing it again? <laughs> and if you don't need it, I'll just preach to myself because I need it. That's for sure. I talked about how I could sit and just judge people and judge them and judge them and never even be convicted by it but at all. But now I know the Word of God that says, judge not lest you be judged. And I've studied judging other people and I've read the scripture that says to mind your own business and, and I've studied about love. And so now if I start to judge somebody, which I did just, you know, not that long ago, these judgmental thoughts. Matter of fact, I was actually sitting in a meeting somewhere, and one of the people that was on the platform, I was having a little opinion about, and, <laughs> but immediately the Holy Spirit rose up in me, and I said, and this is what I do, I said to myself, see, I've learned to preach to myself, I said to myself, Joyce, it's none of your business. You need to talk to yourself, <laughs> amen? What I've learned to do is talk myself off the ledge. How many of you can feel when, you, you know, like if somebody's getting ready to jump and kill themselves, you know, or jump into trouble, they'll send in a negotiator to try to talk them off the ledge. Well, we've got the Holy Spirit, and He is the negotiator that is always ready to talk us off the ledge. Amen? And that's exactly the way that I stay sane. I don't have, I have all the same temptations that everybody else does, but I'm learning daily more and more how to listen to the Holy Spirit. And I don't care what I think or what I feel or what the world says or who says what, He trumps everything else. And when He says it's wrong, then it's wrong. And if He says it's right, then it's right. So the more you study the Word, the more you're going to be convicted. How many of you know what conviction is? It's not condemnation. Conviction is not condemnation. Conviction is good news. It's the Holy Spirit saying, let me help you before you get in trouble. Amen? And the more you study the Word, the more you're going to have conviction, and you should thank God for it, and the quicker you're going to have it, and the minute that conviction comes, you don't need to feel bad that you were starting to have a bad thought. That's the temptation of Satan. He tries to put that on everybody. Just because you have bad thoughts fall in your head, that doesn't make you a sinful, terrible person. It just means that the devil is doing what the devil does. He is lying to you, but you have great help living on the inside of you. And if you will open your mouth and talk back to the devil, Well, I would feel kind of dumb just walking around my house talking back to the devil. Well, I'd rather feel dumb doing that than to have a dumb life. So that was my experience. I just had very little victory, if any, maybe a little here and a little there, but not much. Struggle, struggle, frustrated all the time. I'd never heard any teaching about the power of the Holy Spirit that could be mine. 
I'd never heard, I really was never taught to study the word. Can you imagine being in church eight years and not being taught really to study the word for myself? And I was never taught a message about my thoughts. And I thank God that that changed for me. But for so many people, it never does change. And one of the things that I found out that was so wonderful is what the Bible says about us being new creatures in Christ. New creatures in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Everybody say, in Christ. in Christ. A woman wrote recently and she said, I hear Joyce talk about being in Christ all the time. And I don't know what she means. And I, I, I thought I was doing a good job explaining it. But either I wasn't explaining it good enough or she didn't watch the program where I explained it. Something was wrong. We were... We were missing it somewhere, but that's one of the most important phrases in the Word of God is to learn who we are in Christ and be able to distinguish that from who you are by yourself and in yourself. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He is a new creation altogether. The old previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. Behold, the fresh and the new has come. New creature, new beginning, new opportunities, new power, new desires. Everything becomes new. Now, it actually means that it's possible. Everything becomes possible when Christ comes to live on the inside of you. So... I thought I'd do a couple of examples maybe to help us understand. So what does it mean to be in Christ? Well, you might spend 20, 30, 40, 50 years in the world. And boy, by then you're, you're pretty rooted in this mess, you know? I don't know that you could ever get yourself out of it. I don't think I could have gotten myself out of it. We need some Holy Ghost help to come along and get us out of this and put us in something else. And to be saved by grace literally means that we don't have to do anything to be saved except believe that Jesus is who he says that he is and that he did what he said that he did. If you believe that he died for you, was raised from the dead, you truly believe that in your heart and you confess it with your mouth, the Bible says you will be saved. So at the exact moment that you're saved... You get replanted in another life. Amen? Just that quick. And that's just almost too good to be true. Now, who in their right mind would want to just keep jumping back and forth from pot to pot all the time? Once you get out of that, then you need to stay put in Christ. But there's something that has to happen for this to all work right. The moment that you're in Christ, all these things become possibilities. You're a new creature, new beginning. Everything is new. The past is gone. Brand new beginning. And then there's all these new creation realities. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. God will meet all of our needs. We're talented and gifted and we're anointed. And oh, it's just all so wonderful. And we hear about it in church and we get so excited. And then we go home. We can't seem to make any of it work. Amen? Boy, we hear a message about how important our words are, and so we make a decision. We're going to go home, and we're going to just say all good stuff, and it just never works. It just doesn't work until, <laughs> until we've been in this long enough that we get rooted, come on, rooted and grounded in this new life. And getting roots takes time. Getting rooted in something means you got to stick with it for a long time. I'll never forget the woman that came to me, put her hands on her hips. She, right down there at the altar, the stage wasn't this high, so I was pretty level with her. And she said, I want my money back. <laughs> she said, I want my money back. I said, what do you mean you want your money back? She said, listen, I've been doing what you said to do for two weeks and nothing has changed. I want my money back. I'll tell you what, it was all I could do to keep from laughing right in the woman's face. 
And I thought, oh, honey, <laughs> honey, 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 you've been doing this for two weeks? <laughs> Try 20 years, 25 years, 30 years. Try after five years, not feeling like you've made any progress at all. But actually, we are making progress. But sometimes when you've got such a huge mess in your life, like a 40-year mess, I don't know why we get frustrated with God if, if he doesn't straighten out overnight what it's taken us 40 years to do. Amen? So everything new is inside, and it's got to make its way from the inside to the outside. Now, I have a list here called Knowing Who I Am in Christ, and I actually wrote this list. And if you put into your little computer, knowing who I am in Christ, the first thing that will pop up is this list by Joyce Meyer. I think that's cool. I have made the internet. Amen. And I, you know, there's no way that I could sit here and read all this to you because you wouldn't, you wouldn't focus long enough, but it's three and a half pages worth. And I think that you should get on the internet and get yourself a copy, knowing who I am in Christ. And it should come up first. But I'm just going to read you a few of these things that the Bible says, if you're a believer, how many of you are believers in Christ? Okay. If you're a believer, all of these things are already yours. I don't care if you look like they're yours. I don't care if you act like they're yours. I don't care if you feel like they're yours or if anybody else believes they're yours. They are yours. And until you know they're yours, regardless of what it looks like, see, in God's economy, you believe it first and then you see it. You can't wait to see it and then believe it. You believe it first and then you see it. Your believing becomes your living. So as long as you believe you're a mess, you're going to continue to be a mess. But when you start waking up in the morning, you lay in your bed and you think, I'm anointed. I have gifts and talents. God loves me. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. And then the devil kind of, you know, got that little demon sitting here on your shoulder. Well, <laughs> you're the righteousness of God in Christ. Remember what you did yesterday? Come on. How many of you hear that? Remember what you did yesterday? Yeah. You, you, know, you know what you did. Yeah, you know what you did. And you know, really, you just need to learn to get to the point where you say, thank you for reminding me because now I just remember how good God is to forgive me and wash it all away. And if you think that I'm just making up some weird story, I'm not. This is the way that I live. And unless you're willing to learn to live like this, you're not living according to the Bible and you're not ever going to really experience the freedom that you want to have. You got to learn how to fight like a Christian. And the way you fight like a Christian is you fight with the Word of God, because the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. Amen? So, first one on my list is I'm complete in Christ. So that means I'm complete if I'm single. I don't need to have a husband to be complete. I'm complete if I'm a widow. I can hang out with married people. I don't need to feel like everybody else feels. I'm complete if I don't have a college degree. Matter of fact, I'm complete if I didn't even graduate from high school. We are complete not in the way we look or the job we have or who we know or the label in our clothes or what side of the tracks we live on. We are complete in Christ. Amen? So now you're getting just a little bit taller. I can feel it. See, when you start to know who you are in Christ, you go from this. I mean, you got to get just. Man, by the time you go out of here tonight, you're going to be like, don't mess with me. I'm God's kid. I'm alive with Christ. I like that one. Whoo, I'm alive. I have the peace of God that passes understanding. I have the greater one living in me. Greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I am sanctified. I am redeemed. I am justified. I am holy. All of these things we are in Christ. Now, 
Rooted. What does it mean to be rooted? Well, a tree that has deep roots will not blow over in a storm, will it? The wind doesn't blow it over. It might blow a few leaves off of it, but it's not going to blow over. And likewise, when you're rooted in the truth of God's word, like for example, if you, if you are rooted in the love of God, and that's one of the things that the apostle Paul prayed for the church was that they would be rooted and grounded in the love of God and that they would know the love of God to such a degree that nothing could ever take it away from them. Nothing, no kind of suffering, no peril, no persecution, nothing threatening, nothing they've got, nothing that nothing can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Amen. And I can tell you when you're going through literal hell and you can sit and say, God, I don't understand this, but I know you love me. 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 Let me tell you, it will strengthen you and it will get you through stuff that you would have never, ever thought that you could have went through. Because the love of God is the healing for our brokenness. And it gives you strength and power. And I remember 20 some odd years ago when I had breast cancer. And thank God I don't have any cancer either now. Praise the Lord. But when I had, when I had cancer back then, there were a few things that God said, I want to hear you saying all the time. And one of them was, I know God loves me. Not God why don't you love me? Or, well, God, don't you love me? But I know that God loves me. Be rooted and grounded in the love of God. Another thing the Bible says in Colossians 2, 7 is have the roots of your being firmly and deeply planted in him, fixed and founded in him, being continually built up in him, established in your faith, just as you were taught and abound in it, and overflow in it. We need to be rooted in these in Christ principles. How many times have I said out loud, out of my mouth, I don't know, maybe a million, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Because I tell you, I started out and I felt terrible about myself. I'd been sexually abused by my dad and I grew up feeling like I was no good and that it was my fault and that I just felt terrible about myself. How many of you spent a lot of years feeling terrible about yourself? Well, you need to start confessing who you are in Christ. God loves me. I'm his special child. I'm the apple of his eye. I am God's favorite. And see, that's true because with God, we're all his favorites. But he really means it when he says you're his favorite. God's got his eye on me. You need to say things like that. God loves me. I'm in Christ. I'm born again. I'm filled with the Spirit. I have gifts. I have talents. Let me tell you something. If you'll begin to think differently about yourself, you'll begin to act differently. And the great things that you have on the inside of you will begin to blossom and come out. Amen. And I love this one. Be rooted in your faith. Rooted and grounded in your faith. I believe this is what I believe and I'm not changing my mind. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care how long it takes. This is what I believe. I'm not changing my mind. And we need to really be firm in that in the days that we're living in. This is what I believe, and I don't care what you say. You are not going to get me off of it. I will go to the grave believing this. Because let me ask you a question. When it comes right down to it, what do we have besides God? And what is going to be left besides him when all of this is over? Nothing. And we don't need to be bowing down to the world. We need to be standing firm in faith that God is alive and that he will take care of us and meet our needs. Amen. 1 Peter 5, 9. Now, this has been talking about how the enemy comes against us every chance he gets. Withstand him, be firm in faith against his onset. I love that. When the devil comes against you, don't wait three weeks to rebuke him. Don't even wait three hours. The Bible says, resist him at his onset. Can I give you a, a little phrase that will just be very beneficial to you? Shut up, devil. <laughs> Can everybody say that? Shut up, devil. Thank you. Be firm in faith against his onset, rooted, established, strong, immovable, and determined. 
knowing that the same identical sufferings are appointed to your brotherhood, the whole body of Christians throughout the world. So really, in essence, what he's saying is, look, everybody's going through something. No matter what we're going through, there's somebody that's going through something so much worse. And we will come out on the other side. You will come out. You may not get what you want, but if you don't get what you want, you'll get something better. And it might not seem better to you in the beginning, but let me tell you something, God knows what he's doing. We need to be rooted and grounded in these things that we say that we believe. And when we are, nothing is going to take them away from us. Rooted and grounded in God's love. You know what? We have an enemy, the devil, who is a liar. I said he is a liar. I said he is a liar. <laughs> wonder what he's been lying to you about just this week or even just today. And I wonder how long you listen to it without ever one time really coming against him. You can't hope the devil will leave you alone. You got to make him leave you alone. Amen. And he needs to get it through his head that the longer he hangs around, the longer he's going to have to listen to you. Praise God. Amen. The more he comes against you, the more he's going to hear you talk about how good God is. He is relentless, but we have to make our minds up that we're going to be just as relentless. You cannot be a lazy Christian and have victory. I said you can't be a lazy Christian and have victory. Some people are so lazy they won't even open their mouth and confess the word. It's time to possess the land. Now, let me tell you what the word possess means because we like to shout about that. Yeah, it's time to possess the land. Yeah, well, here's what the word means. This is enlightening. Possess means to occupy by driving out previous tenants and possessing in their place. <laughs> Come on, let's get this again. When, when God told the Israelites to go in and possess the land, he didn't take them in quickly. He took them the long route, and the Bible says because they weren't ready for war. See, when you are determined that you're going to possess what Jesus died to give you, you better get ready for war. Because the devil is not going to take a nap and just let you go in and do everything that God wants you to do. You're going to have a fight on your hands. A wide door of opportunity opened unto me, and Paul said, with it, many adversaries. And we need to know how to fight like a Christian. You don't have to be frustrated. You don't have to be angry. You don't have to be worried. All you need to know is there's one thing he cannot stand against, and that is the Word of God. He can't. I'm convinced he cannot. To possess, to occupy by driving out previous tenants and possessing in their place. To seize, to rob, to impoverish, to expel, to ruin, to cast out, to destroy, to dispossess, to drive out, to make poor. Let's all get together and make the devil poor. Yeah. To make poor and to take possession of. Now, does that sound to you like a lazy, lukewarm, apathetic, pathetic Christian is going to be able to do that? No. We've got to know who we are. We have to not give up in hard times. And I'm telling you what, if anybody in this room really knew what I was like and what I had gone through before God got hold of me. For me to be where I'm at today didn't just happen overnight. And it wasn't easy, but I'll tell you one thing. It was a lot easier than staying in bondage. And I want to encourage you, if you feel like you're getting nowhere, tell the devil to shut up. Some days you're even going to feel like you're going backwards. You ever feel like that, like you're going backwards? It's like, my gosh, I'm acting worse now than I ever have in my whole life. But you know, some days we have days like that. I do some things occasionally that just like, I can't believe I did that. I know better than that. But you know what I also know better than to do? I also know better than to waste three more days feeling bad about it. Amen. Yeah, well, you don't rather clap or not. I said, I also know better than to waste three days feeling bad about it. Now, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And in one way, I, I do feel, 
I'm like, God, I'm just, you get disappointed in yourself. But you know what? You're no surprise to God. He knew what he was getting when he got you. And he knew every mistake that you were going to make before you ever made one of them. And he's already got good plans for you. The Israelites wandered around 40 years in the wilderness trying to make an 11 day journey. I don't know how long you've been wandering in the wilderness. But I can tell you it is time to possess the land. You know, it's very important to know who you are in Christ because the enemy will always attack your identity. Christine Kane of Equip and Empower Ministries joins me now, and she is joining us at this year's Women's Convention. Welcome, Chris. We always love to have you on the show. Oh, it's like family. I'm so glad to be here. Good. Well, you and I have been friends for a long, long time. How many years have you come to the Women's Conference? This is going to be my 19th Women's Conference. 19th. And you haven't missed one, have I haven't you? missed not one, no, and brought my girls with me. So why do you come that often? You know, Joyce, the, the truth is, at 30 years old, we're, we're the, it was the first one that I came to, and God... such a radical work in my life and I, I think you might remember that it was so dramatic um, and every year God has clearly spoken to me you know I think we all need and I'm in full-time ministry yeah. and I travel so much but I think we all need these anchors certain yeah. things where even we come away ourselves I mean yeah. if I wasn't speaking I'd be coming yeah. anyway like I have because you need to create an environment where you're away from all of the noise so that God can actually speak to you. Right. And I think especially for women, it's very important to get away from their normal situation. You know, women are very busy most of the time. They do a lot of multitasking. A lot of women today not only have a family they're trying to take care of, but they're also working full-time jobs. And so it can be pretty overwhelming sometimes, and it's a great opportunity but you have to take the time to do it. So like for you, you're busy all the time. I know you. And yeah. so you're, you have to set aside that time. Absolutely. Well, every year we call it the big rocks. Everyone knows the non-negotiable. It goes straight in the diary, straight in the calendar is the annual women's conference um, because of what it does in my own life. And, you know, sometimes we think I haven't got time. I actually think you don't have time not to go because it's like God supernaturally. He gives you answers, things that you were stressed about. He seems to take care of. You get one nugget, not um, also neglecting the fact that to be in that environment with that many women. Yeah, and I right. love it because you're, even you, you kind of, I mean, if it is possible, even you go there more when it's all the women's conference. <laughs> like, you know, I don't know that that's possible, but it is. Like I, I just kind of, I see you know, I, I, I listen to you nearly every day, but um, I come into that environment and it's like, whoa, it's like an anointing comes on you. Mm -hmm. uh, you dare to go where no one else will go. And it's like the Lord does open heart surgery. Well, the women's conference is, um, it's a special conference for me. Right. Uh, this year will be the 34th year that we've done that conference here in St. Louis. And uh, we always put 
a lot of work into it. Our team here just does a lot of special media stuff, and we, we have great music, and there's just so many wonderful things that can happen. But I think that, you know, a lot of women probably watching today, you might think, well, I watch Joyce on television. Why should I do that? And many of them think, well, I'd have to travel. I'd have to do this and that and something else. But I think sometimes the more we are willing to sacrifice or the more effort we're willing to take to do something like that, yeah. the more God really pours his spirit out on a person. And I would imagine that there's all kinds of women even watching right now that they have some real serious problems and they need some real answers and they're trying to get those answers in the busyness of their life. Yeah. But honestly, it very well could be that if they would set apart this time and say, well, God, I'm going to do this. They might have to sacrifice money. They might have to sacrifice time. They might have to get child care. But I believe that people, if they do it, they're going to see a result. I have, I have women tell me all the time after the conference or write in and tell us, you know, I'm not going to miss that conference anymore. It was, it was life-changing for and me. I, and which is why I still, at this level of ministry, continue to go because of what God does in that, in, in that, that small period of time. I think he honors the fact that we want to put him first. I think, I no matter what, I, I think I, that's the key. If you and, put God first, God spoke to me one time about the women's conference, and he said, whatever you put into it, you're going to get out of it. Powerful. And so we even here at the ministry, not that all of our conferences aren't important to us because they are, and we yes. prepare and plan, but there really is a lot of extra work that goes into this conference. I mean, this place is like a buzzsaw, you know, a couple of months before the conference, everybody trying to get their stuff done, and we try to make it just as good as it possibly can be Oh, for that particular conference. And it is right from the opening moment. We yeah. won't give any, but I mean, really, those openers are, are just yeah. breathtaking. And I know the whole team puts in yeah. so much. But but every every facet of the conference, to me, and in a time where people are really busy and people have to right. make choices, you don't want to waste anyone's time. And I think that's what I love about it. You, there's not a waste of time. There is a healthy bit of laughter as well. Like I just think, and, and sometimes just laughter does good like medicine to be uh -huh. around a whole lot of uh, estrogen laden laughing women is hilarious. The teaching is powerful. You bring a diverse range of teachers too, which I think is awesome. Um, every year there is a different band, people from different streams too, which I think is fantastic because you then expose everyone. I mean, you know, I personally think you're the greatest Bible teacher of our generation. But the fact that someone like you would say, hey, the Lord speaks through different voices too and let's hear something. And then to see yeah. you on the front row taking notes from yeah. other teachers, to me is just, it, 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 that does more discipleship. and teaches more to all of us than anything that you can learn from everyone. Well, this year we've got uh, quite a good lineup. Oh, yeah. We've got you and uh, Beth Moore. That's it. And Carrie Job is going to be leading worship, and she has just become very popular. And, of course, I'm going to be there. I, I get to teach, too. So I have another question for you. Do you believe, because I think a lot of times people might think, well, it, it's, just, it's just an event. You know, how, how can that change my life that much? So... Do you believe that a conference like this can make real changes in people's lives after they go home? A hundred percent. There is no way that I would give my life to it if I didn't believe that. I think that the conference, you encounter God, there's a, cal a catalyst happens. Something is activated. 
Um, and then I think, in fact, you know, you've got you on TV teaching and discipling. There's the Word of God. There's church. What it does is it activates something that then will continue with you. Like I said, for me, it's a, a mile marker. Every year, I know at that time of the year that something profound. And when I think of all the major ministry that the Lord has allowed to come out of my life, I can uh, pinpoint it back to something was activated at a women's conference, at one of your women's conferences, and I could have been sitting and not even thinking. I think there was one major thing happened um, when when Dave was speaking at one sense. In uh, uh, Dave came up to do a greeting. You know how you two come up and do... I mean, I won't put it on camera, but there was something very powerful in that moment. The Lord just did something very major for us in that, that just was a course correction that I think has kept us on track. That's what I mean. You just don't even know which angle God's going to do it, but you have to be in the room under the anointing where God can start that process and then the ongoing effects go through the years. Yeah, I'm actually a little bit jealous as you talk about how much you get out of the women's (laughs) conference. You know why? Because I rarely get a chance to do that because I'm always ministering yes. myself. But when I do get an opportunity to go and just sit mm-hmm. and just be part of the worship and just receive teaching, it is true that you can really pick up things that you didn't even know you needed. Totally. And, and you yeah. get answers about things that you hadn't even maybe even asked questions about yet. I think, it, And yeah. so I just, you know, I really, of course it is my conference, so I would love you to come. <laughs> But I just, I really want to encourage you ladies that if, if you set aside this time, I don't think you'll be sorry. But I do want to tell you ahead of time that the devil will probably try to talk you out of it oh, yeah. and keep you away and give you 900 reasons why it won't work and it's not important. So just really follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And if you feel in your heart that it's something you're supposed to do, then don't come up with a bunch of reasons why you can't. Just begin to make plans. I just want to jump in there because I think the hour is so urgent on the earth today yeah. and the church, we have to be alert and awake. And if God is gathering his daughters together and saying, look, all throughout scripture, there has have been times of assembling together. And I think on the kingdom calendar, we're in one of those seasons right now. There is so much craziness happening around the earth that I think God's saying, would you just step out of that? Yeah. Come and assemble and gather together. And we're not talking, and yes, it will be fun. And yes, there are all the great natural gains. But spiritually, I don't think this side of eternity, we can even measure how powerful it is. I mean, for me to stay on track, to keep hearing the voice of the Lord, hopefully to be ministering, I need to come aside. I need to assemble and go, God, what are you saying? And may I even suggest that I think this is quite a historic conference in this nation. Um, The very fact that we have you, that we have Beth Moore, both of you, um, in your own unique ways, a, a once in a, a generation kind of female leaders and that the Lord has given you both such a voice and for the first time to come together in America on that platform. Yeah. I, I just need to say that I, I personally believe prophetically that it is very strategic. It's, um, it's never happened before and it, God has waited until now for it to happen. And I think there's a really big reason for it. So I want to say to anyone that's watching this program, as someone, you know, that has been in this for 30 years, uh, for me to be saying, I think we need to press pause, rearrange whatever needs to be rearranged, make the time uh, to be able to position ourselves where I believe God's going to speak to us in a very fresh and a new and a strategic way for the time that we're in right now in this nation. One thing is for sure, if we want unity in the body of Christ, which means that even though we don't all belong to the same denomination, which by the way, there's going to be none of that in heaven. So it's it's a shame we make so much out of it here. But um, if we're going to expect people to come together in unity, which really God expects that. That was the great prayer that he prayed in John 17. And
then certainly the leaders are going to have to begin to fellowship together and lay aside whatever their own little doctrinal differences totally. might be. We all need to have good sound doctrine, but I think we're smart enough to realize there's a lot of little things that are peripheral oh, yeah. that people fight about that really don't make that much difference. And so I want to ask you one more question just before we're out of time here. What will be, I know you don't know exactly what you're going to speak yeah. on, but what will be the heart of your message? What what do you like to bring to women? Yeah, and, and I think, you know, we're going to be talking a lot about purpose and potential. And I think I really want to show, you know, I think... Many women, for want of a better phrase, are dead before they die. And the thing that kills them is all of this unused, God-given life that's on the inside of them and potential. And you know, Joyce, um, just a, a little over a year ago, I was lying in UCLA hospital. You know, I, had, I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer and um, it was between my trachea and my larynx, which is disturbing when you're a speaker, you know. And so I'm lying there. It's somewhat disconcerting, you know, you're going to yeah, slash my leg. Yeah. But I remember saying to the Lord, that's why this is very fresh for me, bringing, uh, coming into the conference with this. And there were only two final, before the general anaesthetic really took, you know, over my body, I, I, I remember two distinct thoughts and I was talking to Jesus. There was no fear. And at this point, we didn't know how dramatic it was, you know, how bad or good it was. And praise God, it was fine. But um, I said to him, Lord, I really hope that I did everything you put me on the earth to do. Yeah. And I really hope that I'm bringing everyone home with me that I'm yeah. supposed to bring home. And it was like, it brought it all down to my purpose. That's right. really what it's yeah. about. Yeah, and you know, a purposeless life is always a very unfulfilled totally. life. There are so many people that are unhappy. They don't even know why they're unhappy. Yeah. But they're unhappy because they're just kind of going through each day, going through the motions, and they don't even really know what it is they're supposed to be doing. They're not, they're not really living their purpose. They're just surviving. Exactly. And making it through each day. And Jesus said, I came that you might have life and life right. more abundant. And I believe that's why women need to position themselves because I think God's going to activate the purpose and potential in multiplied thousands of women because the hour is urgent. Right. We need all hands on deck. And I think a lot of women that have just kind of been just going through the religious cycle are suddenly going to go discover that God has a purpose and a plan for them. I agree. Well, I'm looking forward to it. You know, uh, I really want to invite you to this year's Women's Conference, which is September the 29th through October the 1st, please come and bring somebody with you. Yeah. Today, we have a special offer for you. We, we have uh, Thinking Transformed, which is the teaching from last year's Women's Conference, five hours of teaching on CD. You'll not only get the teachings from me, but from our guest speakers, and uh, they're going to offer you an Enjoying Everyday Life coffee mug. If you're going to drink coffee, you might as well drink it out of my mug, you know. We could have coffee together every day. So please get these resources. The Word of God is so valuable. It changes your life. The Bible says that it has the power to save our souls. You know, we're born again when we receive Christ as our Savior. Good things happen in our spirit. But I'll tell you, your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions can give you a lot of trouble. The Word of God is what changes all that. So thank you for being with us today, and we hope to see you at the conference. Transform your thinking, words, and attitudes with this five-part CD series, Thinking Transformed, from our 2015 Love Life Women's Conference featuring Joyce Meyer and including special guest speakers Craig Grishel and Darlene Check. Learn how to get through the valleys of life by believing and speaking God's Word. Transform your mind so you can have the life God intended for you to live. This series is available for your gift of $30 or more. And while you're listening to the teaching series, you'll also enjoy your favorite beverage with this Enjoying Everyday Life mug. To order, call us toll-free at 1-800-727-9673 or visit us at JoyceMeyer.org. You are valuable. You are valuable. You are a valuable asset to God. He created you with his own hand. He has a plan for you and a purpose for you. And you are worth taking care of. You know, it's really amazing how many people are living in a constant state of overload. Do you say things like, I can't do this much longer? Well, it may be the way of our culture, but that doesn't mean you have to live that way. 
In my new book, Overload, I'll show you that you don't have to live every day stressed out and overwhelmed. Remember, God doesn't always want to change everything around you. He wants to change you. Get your copy of my